A golden civilization is a civilization of great people, not great powers. So I'd like to start tonight with a reflective exercise that comes from my career as a life planner, uh, an exercise that connects us with our own greatness, uh, with our deepest levels of meaning, uh, with, uh, with our greatest sense of freedom. In a golden civilization, all people are free. Uh, and we use this exercise, this series of questions that uh, I'll introduce uh, with people to inspire them to live into, to step into, to imagine, and then step into their dream of freedom. Uh, dream of freedom that becomes so palpable and so powerful that they can't choose not to step into it. The first question, appropriately, because we're in talking about a golden civilization, we can't help but come up with questions and issues around money, involves money. And you will see as we move through the questions that they move to uh, deeper and deeper levels of meaning. So starting first with the, the first question, question number one, and you can read this, but I'm just going to speak it uh, as I feel it. Um, yeah, uh, question number one asks you to reflect that you wake up one morning and you discover that you have all the money that you need for the rest of your life. You know, it's like winning the lottery. You've got it. It's there. The question is, what would you do with your life if that happened? How would you live your life? What would it be like? So I'm just going to give you a moment or two to reflect on each of these questions. If we were doing this in a client setting or in a workshop setting, I, I might give you ten, 10 minutes with each question. The second question goes deeper. So this one's kind of fun, and you win the lottery, and you have fun with it. The second question goes deeper. Here, I want you to imagine that you go to your doctor and feeling perfectly healthy, but the doctor's been doing some tests. And the doctor shocks you with the, uh, with the news that you have a rare illness. And that illness means that, well, there's good news and bad news. The illness is an illness that will bring about your demise. That's, this is the bad news in five to 10 years. You just keel over. You don't know. You'll know you'll last at least five years. But beyond that, you don't. Uh, the good news is that you'll feel as healthy as you feel right now. So you're going to feel pretty good. The question is, what would you do with your life? How, how would you live your life? And you can see that it's a, it's a, it's a deeper place. It's a deeper question. <coughs> than the prior question as we're moving into layers, layers of meaning. The third question goes deeper still. The scenario starts the same as the scenario that you go to visit your doctor and, uh, and your doctor stuns you this time with, with the worst news you could have. And that is that you only have 24 hours left to live. You've had an illness. <coughs> even though you didn't even know that you did, and it's come to term. So the question is not what you would do with that 24 hours. The question is reflecting on all of the things that you'd imagined doing with the rest of your life, accomplishing, being. What did you miss? Who did you not get to be? What did you not get to do? It's a deep question. Earnest, reflective, profound. For most people, uh, uh, reflecting on these questions, writing on these questions, wakes them up with a jolt of recognition that th there's something in their life they haven't accomplished and they're really meant to accomplish it. 
So for most people, there is this surge of energy that comes out of this. With a skilled life planner, what happens is that we design a dream of freedom that often has as its basis, most often has as its basis, the response, the responses to question number three. Sometimes it may be more question number two and there may be other elements that enter in. Question number three, uh, uh, typically, just to give you a sense of what's there, because we're, we're all in this boat together. We're all, it, it, it's the same for everybody. The number one thing that comes up, not, not for everybody, but for most people, is family or relationship. Uh, the second most common thing has to do with spirit or values. So it's a deeper, in a profound way. The third most common thing was a real surprise to me when I was uh, doing this work actively with, with people, and that is creativity. Uh, it can be creativity in business, but it's often creativity in the arts. The, the fourth most common theme has to do with community. It's one that you might expect. And the fifth most common theme has to do with uh, the environment, with a sense of place, uh, often with Mother Earth. So th those are the themes. And, but what is astonishing in doing this, when we deliver to the client, we craft a, a vision for them out of these, uh, these elements. And a few other things. We ask them what their ideal day, week, and year might look like. And we, so we'll pepper the, the, uh, the offer, the vision, uh, with a lot of things that bring vitality clearly to the client, really excitement. And as I said, the response is one of enormous enthusiasm. I mean, you, you really, uh, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't believe the amount of enthusiasm that comes out of these engagements because they feel permission and they feel that they are at last confronting who they were always meant to be. They're no longer chasing after the dollar. They recognize that that's not who they want to be and they are given a stark choice and they choose it to in fact live their life of greatest meaning. So this, this spirit, this energy, I, I've come to recognize it as entrepreneurial. Whether it has to do with improving relationships that they're in or, or uh, creativity or, or business or community or the planet. Um, it, has, it has so much energy, there's no question, it's an entrepreneurial spirit. So as I've thought about the design of a golden civilization, one of the things I want is to bring this to people all over the world. We are lucky to be in 30 countries. Uh, this question is active in 30 countries, including some of the poorest countries in the world, including Kenya, for instance, and, and India. Um, so there, there is a movement to bring this kind of uh, uh, profound relationship with uh, the world and with money into all, into all uh, uh, segments of society. You know, in, when we think about crafting a golden civilization, there are many layers to it. And some of the layers are explicitly economic, have to do with politics and government. What is remarkable to me about the response to this question, the vitality that comes out of the, uh, the, reflect, the reflections on this question, is that when you look at how government tries to stimulate entrepreneurial activity or tries to stimulate innovation in society, it's all fiscal policy or, or monetary policy. It, it's big industrial stuff. I want to see it happening from the grassroots. I want everybody to be alive, not stimulated by having access to debt, but by having access to their most profound passions and knowing that they've got a supportive environment to make it happen. My hunch is that if you want a society of tremendous innovation and growth, much more innovation than we see right now, where our entrepreneurial endeavor comes out of the elite, you know, kind of business school environment of private equity and venture capital, if we get it at the grassroots with everybody on fire, uh, what could be more astonishing, more innovative, more entrepreneurial, more powerful, more growth oriented toward what we care about in growth, toward people, uh, toward what is humane than that? Thank you. <laughs>